So we're going to be talking about uh, uh, the North American numbering plan or phone numbers. Uh, we're going to go into a brief history. We're going to uh, talk about who is uh, the uh, North American numbering plan administrator and some of the requirements um, that uh, carriers uh, need in order to be ordering phone numbers. Uh, we're going to be talking about carriers, in particular, uh, all our carriers uh, and what we need. Uh, Uh, in order to uh, order uh, phone numbers. Um, we're also going to be talking about uh, local number portability, uh, just a little bit of history, the process and the requirements, and at the end we'll uh, go ahead and uh, give a uh, brief summary. So let's go ahead and start with the North American numbering plan. Uh, this was created by AT&T back in the uh, 1940s for the Bell Systems in order to unify uh, local numbering plans. Um, pretty much the um, system had to, uh, the Bell Systems were running into an issue where uh, the plans didn't match and AT&T came over and said, hey, we can help you and thus the North American numbering plan was uh, born. Uh, in 1982, after the breakup of the Bell Systems, the administration was delegated to the FCC. Uh, the FCC took it over, and um, at that point, they awarded uh, a company by the name of Lockheed Martin uh, the uh, contract to manage the North American numbering plan. They, uh, North American or Lockheed Martin, managed that for a while. Uh, and then they spun off a company called uh, Newstar, which uh, we'll get to here in a little bit. But the North American numbering plans, it's a pretty much states that any phone number is going to be 10 digits. Uh, the first three being the uh, number planning area where uh, the first uh, digit is going to be any digit between two and nine, the second and the third, uh, any digit between zero and nine. And then your next set of three numbers is going to be your prefix and your exchange uh, where um, again the n represents any digit between two and nine and the x any uh, digit between zero and nine and you last for your line number um, which that can be um, any digit again between zero and nine um, the uh, north american numbering plan administrator or nampa they uh, choose um, new numbering plan uh, uh, codes and uh, exchange codes. So uh, if in an, an, any given area they are running out of uh, phone numbers uh, or area codes, they uh, assign them. Um, the original plan was uh, consisted of 86 uh, calling areas or uh, area codes. And you can see here the uh, original ones uh, in this little picture of where, um, you know, when it first started. And as you can see here in California, uh, central to northern California was 415. And now we have uh, quite a bit more than that in uh, that particular area. So, um, so I was saying earlier, uh, Lockheed Martin uh, in 1982 was granted the um, uh, contract to be the number administrator um, and they were all right can anybody can, can everybody hear me okay is everybody hearing me okay okay thanks um, uh, so new star uh, was spun off from Lockheed Martin and they are now serving as the North American Lumbering uh, Plan Administrator. Uh, they host, uh, hold the overall responsibility for neutral uh, administration of the uh, North American Lumbering Plan and uh, numbering resources. So what that means is uh, they cannot make any uh, 
preference uh, over any over one carrier over another uh, when ordering uh, phone numbers. Uh, the responsibilities of what the uh, administrator uh, does are defined by the FCC. Uh, the FCC does not have a uh, group uh, itself that fall under them. Instead, it takes guidelines from uh, diff different uh, in industry uh, working groups um, that uh, are composed of uh, representative from uh, different carriers, and they come up with uh, definitions and guidelines as to uh, processes uh, that they need to follow. Uh, they meaning uh, New Star. Uh, again, uh, they are not a policy uh, making entity. And today we have over uh, 325 area code or MPAs and over 100,000 exchanges. So with that, let's go ahead and get into number ordering. What is a uh, carrier, uh, what are the requirements from NAMPA for a carrier to be able uh, to order phone numbers? Well, one of the first things that a uh, company must have is an operating company number or uh, OCN. Uh, they must have uh, also a current number number and resource utilization forecast uh, with uh, NAMPA. So any area that they uh, want to serve, they must provide and say, hey, for this area, we are expecting to use uh, this many numbers by uh, this time. Uh, they must also provide uh, proof of facility ready, uh, readiness if they are opening up a new uh, code uh, or uh, MPA and XX. Um, and a lot of the times what they do is, you know, they'll have to provide their uh, carrier's uh, switch identification or silly code and say, this is my switch, this is where it, the areas that I serve, and here is my uh, proof that I am ready um, to support this area. Uh, the other thing that they need is a uh, uh, months to exhaust uh, forecast. Uh, what that means is they have to be uh, able to say, hey, I am running out of numbers in this area. I have 75%, uh, at least 75% usage, and over the next six months, I am going to run out. So I need to apply for more um, numbers. Um, the minimum minimum waiting period uh, to get a uh, new uh, code is uh, 66 days. Again, that's the minimum provided that nothing goes without hitch. Uh, realistically, in my experience, it's been more about anywhere between 70 and 75. Um, and that's just to account for things like, oh, you forgot this signature here, or you didn't submit this, or we also need this other paperwork. Um, it, you know, anytime that you have to resubmit, you get put back to the end of the line. It's in a, uh, when you uh, request phone numbers uh, from NAMPA, it's gonna be on a first come, first serve basis. Um, the other requirement uh, that uh, NAMPA has is that the, uh, carrier must uh, be local number uh, portable capable, LMP capable. That means that if they order phone numbers, they are going to be able to port from one carrier to another. Um, they must also be uh, set up with the Number Portability Administration Center or MPEC. And again, that's just to uh, make sure that uh, they can uh, uh, submit and request ports. So once a uh, carrier is given a uh, new set of numbers uh, or new codes, they say they must enter these numbers into the Business Integrated Routing and Rating Database System, or BIRDS. That uh, database is kept up by a company called Telecordia. Um, and this is a, it's a huge database and it has every single uh, area code and prefix in how 
this number should be routed. This is how, once your information is in there, once the carrier puts the information it's in there, they're telling the um, PSTN, in order for you to route a call to me, this is where you must connect. This is where you must go. So that's uh, also a uh, one of the requirements um, that uh, each carrier must uh, submit to. So uh, for that, for uh, carriers. So on our network, we have uh, multiple carriers. Uh, the thing to note here is that uh, most uh, wholesale carriers provide service in specific regions, mostly uh, medium to large size uh, cities. Uh, not all carriers have access to all numbers. So for example, um, if uh, let's say uh, one of our carriers that we have on here is, is Peerless, they say they ordered um, a block of a thousand numbers from uh, Nampa. Um, you know, they'll say, "Hey, I want the four one five eight eight six, and they'll say, "I want the two thousand block." So that block just that those two thousand numbers from four five four one five eight eight six uh, two thousand to uh, two thousand. 999 all belong to uh, PeerList. They are the only ones that have access to issue those numbers. Um, so company, uh, let's say here, Bandwidth cannot come and say, oh yeah, uh, I have that number, I can get that for you. Once a, a thousand block has been assigned to that uh, customer uh, or to that carrier, uh, no other carrier has access to it. Unless, of course, you go to that carrier and then you port. Um, so um, the other thing uh, carriers must do, they must apply uh, for telephone numbers through uh, NAMPA. And like we uh, saw earlier, uh, you know, the requirements uh, that each carrier has to go through are uh, quite extensive. Um, the other thing to mention here is we use multiple carriers in order to uh, try and encompass the majority uh, in the mid to large size cities and even sometimes the uh, smaller ones. Um, so we try to uh, use a good number of them to have the uh, greater uh, cover coverage. Um, these are some of the ones that we currently use, the ones that you see on this slide. But um, I know we're also in talks with uh, others um, to uh, be able to, like I said, provide better uh, coverage for uh, our resellers. So with that, um, like I was stating earlier, uh, once a phone number block is assigned to a company, that company or another company cannot come in and um, say, oh, I want that number or I'm gonna assign this number. But with local number portability, we have the capability of moving that number uh, from, let's say, a peerless carrier over to an AT&T carrier, and we'll see an example here in a little bit. But what is uh, local number portability? In 1996, the FCC, uh, I, I put authorized here uh, all local exchange carriers to offer local number portability, but I think that was more of a uh, mandate more than uh, an author uh, authorization. Uh, pretty much the FCC told the uh, local carriers, if you want to be able to uh, provide uh, long distance services on top of local services, you also have to uh, allow for uh, local number portability. And the good thing about that is that uh, it increased competition. It gave uh, uh, way, paved the way for carriers, new carriers to come along. Uh, so in, um, it allows users to keep uh, telephone uh, when switching providers. So you're allowed to keep your same phone number. You, if you don't like your uh, carrier that you're with, you can say, sorry, I am gonna go with XYZ and I am taking my phone number. You don't have to worry about disconnected and then getting your uh, phone number to, uh, uh, all your contacts again. Um, 
in this case, if you have your phone number for like me, I've had mine for uh, I think over 15, 15 years now. Uh, I've had the same phone number, so I've uh, I just been able to port it. If I had to change carriers for one reason or another, and um, local number portability was not available, it would have been a nightmare trying to uh, find out who I've given that number to and where that number has been. So. With that said, we have three types of port. Uh, we have an intercarrier, intracarrier, and number pooling. Uh, intercarrier is the one that uh, most of you are familiar with, um, and that just means that you're able to move from one, uh, take your phone number from one company to another. Uh, intracarrier uh, is used uh, for companies themselves. The ownership of the phone number is not being changed. It's more of a uh, maintenance um, that uh, companies do if they're trying to consolidate uh, larger area or smaller areas into one uh, one area rather than having three to four switches. Maybe they want to combine and have it all in one. Um, the other thing that uh, we were um, uh, the other thing that uh, we do for porting is number pooling. That's not necessarily us, um, but that's more for, uh, you don't normally see that. Uh, that's more for, like I said, more maintenance uh, type activities for uh, carriers. Okay. All right, that's it. So what happens actually um, during a port? So uh, as a new carrier, uh, we require, Request um, as the request is made, the carrier is going to check to see if they have uh, coverage in the requested area. Uh, after this um, checks out, then the carrier is going to require uh, paperwork um, to make sure uh, that um, we get the uh, number, the right information uh, of the number that needs to be ported. Um, and once we have that, we uh, submit the paperwork or the carrier submits the paperwork into the uh, NPAC system. And we'll go over here. So the old carrier, what do they do? So the old carrier uh, is notified via the uh, NPAC system, uh, the Number Portability Administration Center, that there is a port. Uh, the old carrier then uh, reviews all the uh, paperwork and matches it against an account and make sure that everything matches and that it is a legitimate and nobody's trying to uh, uh, quote unquote steal a phone number. Uh, the old carrier either then rejects uh, the order because you know a number of reasons. Uh, a lot of the times it's because let's say uh, the phone number and the account number don't match. Um, maybe the person that is requesting the port is not an authorized user to make changes um, and stuff like that. Or the other option is that they get to accept it and the port uh, schedules uh, requested and is entered into the uh, NPAC system. So what happens on the uh, uh, date of port? So the new carrier automatically uh, is transferred the number uh, from the old carrier. Uh, the new carrier adds the customer's phone number into their system. And so number two, you know, I put we put number two on here as happening the day of port. Um, most of you do this uh, either a day or a couple of days in advance. We do the pre-provisioning and enter all the information on there. Um, the third step is if the old carrier, in theory, once the port completes, should remove uh, that phone number from their system. So let's go ahead and take in this visually and see what's actually happened. So let's pretend that uh, we want to port 415-234-1111 uh, from AT&T to one of our uh, carriers at 2600 hertz. And as you can see in the impact system, it shows it being with uh, AT&T. If everything checks out, 
AT&T schedules the transfer date for, let's say, a day of 10-15. Again, that's a date in the past, but let's just go ahead and assume that that's in the future. Um, you'll see here that I have a date on here of 10-15 and date on here of 10-18. I did that for a purpose. Um, a lot of the times we can request a specific uh, day of a port to happen, but it's ultimately up to the uh, losing carrier, in this case AT&T, to uh, give us the final date. So we requested here the uh, date of 1015, but they said, well, we can't do it on then, we're going to do it on 1018 at uh, 2 p.m. So then on 1018, the uh, owner uh, of the number changes uh, and the number is removed from AT&T and add into the new carrier. Uh, as you see here, the number and now the current carrier peerless. And as you can see, it just goes like that from one carrier over to another. And I know I put on here that it's, this is automatically and it almost is, but believe it or not, there is actually somebody um, pressing a button saying, activate, activate, activate on each number. Uh, now, granted, you can put, uh, if you have large orders, they put all the numbers in one order and you can activate all, so they don't have to do it one by one, but that's how they do it. So, unfortunately, not everything goes as planned sometimes, and there are three different ways that can things can get messed up during the port. Uh, the first one being the old provider schedules the date and time for transfer differently than expected. And, you know, that can be to either uh, reason uh, whether we enter it wrong or they enter it wrong or there's miscommunications and they tell us one date, but they actually meant a different date. So. Um, I would say the first one is a lot of it is human error, um, and that's you know it it can cause an issue, but it's easily fixable. Uh, number two, the old provider releases the number, uh, but the new provider doesn't add it to their database. So now we uh, now the new number is owned by the new provider, but calls don't actually go anywhere because it's not in the old providers or it's not with the new provider. So the call will fail because it has nowhere to terminate. The uh, third example of uh, how things can go wrong is the old provider releases a number to the new provider, but the old provider fails to delete the number from their database. Now the number uh, is going to route to both the old provider and the new provider depending on who calls it. Um, so what that means is in that situation, um, if a person that resides with a phone number that resides in the same uh, equipment that the telephone being ported is in, if they call that ported telephone number, those calls are going to fail because the number has already ported out, but calls are still uh, hitting that phone, the old provider because they haven't removed the translations and the uh, call will not route out of that equipment. So it'll, it just keeps trying and trying. Everybody else that's not part of that will be able to reach that customer. Uh, but it's just certain numbers. Uh, and a lot of the times you hear us ask for example numbers, and that's one of the reasons why, because we try to figure out what the commonality is between the numbers that are not able to call versus the ones that are able to reach. Um, a lot of the times it's going to require us a phone call to the old provider and we put on here begging them to fix it, and that is literally what we have to do. Um, it's very hard. A lot of times you get bounced around. You finally get to somebody that knows, oh, yeah, I know exactly what's going on, uh, and they'll fix it for us. But 
um, it literally <laughs> requires a lot of begging uh, to get them fixed. Uh, and it's often as, or it's often called as being dropping translations on the old provider. And that's all that means is they have to remove it from their equipment before uh, other customers from that equipment can call that number. All right, so now we're going to look at the requirements for a port. Oftentimes, you see us, you hear us asking, requiring a letter of authorization, a bill, and sometimes we ask for a customer service record. Uh, a customer service record, we would uh, love to have uh, on every port um, only because it gives us the exact information we need for that given telephone number. And what we're looking for is the company name, the service address, bill and telephone number. And of course, uh, I didn't put it on here, but the numbers that are uh, looking to be ported. Like I said, that information right here can be gathered from these three pieces of documentation. So in summary, um, you know, carriers must apply for numbers through uh, the NANPA system. Uh, and uh, they must have a presence in the area that they are planning uh, to serve. Uh, one thing to note is that not all areas are uh, serviceable by one carrier uh, or not all numbers are uh, portable. I would say that the great majority of them are. Um, uh, for our purposes, we use multiple carriers to try and cover uh, a great majority of where uh, you are doing business in. And the final note on here is that preparation is a key. We must uh, be prepared to uh, provide documentation that is uh, required from us. Um, the more information that we have and that we can provide to our carriers uh, when we're requiring a port, um, the smoother the transition is going to be and the quicker uh, that we can get a, a number ported into us. And, you know, that works uh, out for all parties. It works out for your customer. You're not getting uh, asked and Hey, when is this going to happen? When is this going to happen? What's the what's wrong um, and whatnot? Um, I'll say that that is the requirements um, that I listed earlier are um, generally what all uh, carriers ask for. Um, some are more difficult than others. Um, to give you an example, there's uh, 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 Sun Link, I believe, uh, and they are very uh, picky uh, when it comes to porting out. And what I mean by that is, if the when we uh, submit orders and the company name uh, is all capital letters um, in their system, we submit it with just the first letter of the company name being capital and the rest lowercase. They will reject that for an invalid company name. Um, so we have to be um, you know, uh, cognizant of that and uh, keep those things in mind as well. Um, so with that said, that uh, concludes the presentation. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, unmute everybody and uh, we'll go look at the uh, questions that are in uh, chat. Thanks. All participants are now unmuted. All right. Thanks for everybody to um, joining. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, go through here and uh, see uh, what uh, questions were asked in chat, or if you have uh, any questions uh, that I may be able to answer regarding the uh, presentation um, for you. Let me know. It looks like there's a couple questions in chat there. Yeah. Uh, Jim, oh, uh, the question is, can I download the presentation? Jim, we are recording this presentation. We'll uh, 
probably make it available uh, via the uh, community. We'll uh, put it on there. Uh, Cami, do we need to request a CNAM update for all numbers that are ported in? Uh, that is going to be up to you. Um, the way the uh, call name uh, works, each carrier uh, subscribes to different databases. Uh, so if a if carrier A and carrier B don't have the same uh, CNAM databases, we have number ports that uh, over to uh, carrier from carrier A to carrier B. That information is not going to transfer over. So in that case, uh, you would. Uh, I would again. I would say that it's in a case by case uh, basis. Uh, can you reject a port based on bills not paid? Uh, question from Bluetail. Uh, yes, we uh, actually. A lot of the times they don't tell us uh, when if it's due to a bill that's not being paid. Um, the losing carrier will not tell us, but they'll say something to the effect of uh, this port has been rejected. Customer uh, must contact their current carrier uh, to resolve uh, any issues. Um, and a lot of the time, that's what it means that they have an outstanding bill um, with the uh, current carrier. Uh, viewer number 111, please make video available. I missed the beginning of it. Uh, again, uh, we recorded this. We'll make it available uh, through community. Uh, question from Rick. Can you explain a bit more in detail how the current carrier is determined uh, when a call is placed? Uh, Rick, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure. Hey, uh, this, yeah. is, this is Darren here. Yeah. Um, and hi, Rick. Uh, so uh, I'll help you out here. Uh, Rick, there are two methods. There's Well, they all go back to SS7 requests on the core PSTN network. And it's actually basically the equivalent of a database lookup, but across the phone network to ask the central database who is the current owner of the number. And then there's something called the LRN. Uh, which is the routing number that is associated with the company, and that tells the carriers how to route the call to the other carrier. Uh, I don't know, Isaac, uh, so I, I want to be clear. This company has nothing to do with us and um, is not affiliated with 2600 Hertz in any way, but they're the only ones I know of who have a public, public web page where you can look this up. It's kind of one of our secrets that we use to go look up stuff, but we can share it. It's not really a secret. Um, Isaac, do you have the ability to share a web browser on this presentation real quick? Uh, yeah. No, no. Uh, I can go ahead and do that. Give me a second here. Do you want to share that Alcazar uh, Networks? So this is one of the companies that gives you access to SS7 info. The only reason I like them is because you don't have to actually pay anything to get a demo of this, which can be handy. Um, and so you can actually, Rick, to answer your question, you can look up any number in the country, and you can... Uh, uh, find, uh, just type in Alcazar, ALC, well, of course, because <laughs> of our <laughs> network. Um, I'm trying to type in Alcazar. Yeah, no worries. Uh, Alcazar Networks, LNP, to find, yep, and do, uh, uh, all the way at the bottom, and they change their site map, all the way at the bottom of that page, um, where that works too. Uh, so you can actually type a phone number in the bottom of this. So, uh, for example, um, you could type in our picture, there you go. And you can now see that this is somebody's cell phone and that it is owned by Sprint. Um, and actually in the case of Sprint, the LRN is the phone number with them. But if you typed in, uh, why don't you go ahead and type in our main office number, Isaac. Okay. 415-886-7900. Uh, um, so in this case, it actually shows that we host that number through 01 Communications, which is correct. Uh, and you'll see that the LRN number is actually different. Uh, that's the routable number that the internal systems can contact to uh, to then say, hey, the actual requested number is 415-886-7900, but they have programmed routes to reach just the LRN. Uh, and this is the database lookup, by the way, that's actually uh, what should change when a number port happens. Um, and 
uh, and, and this is basically what Isaac's been describing in this number handoff. And one thing I should point out here is um, uh, you can use this tool uh, to see who your who customers you're selling to are currently using as a service provider. It's a little creepy, and it's not really what that's supposed to be used for. It might not even be. It might be against regulation, so I'm not actually recommending that. Uh, but it's not something that we. It is something that we've heard people have done in the past. They call a customer and say, uh, you know, uh, hey, I see that you're using uh, Verizon today. You can lower your rates. Uh, so that's an option, although, again, it's not supposed to be used for that purpose. But this is actually the current carrier designation lookup. It is sometimes cached, so you need to assume it might be delayed up to 24 hours. And there are other services who will do these lookups besides this company. Um, so hopefully that answers Rick's question. Isaac, I'll let you take back over. Yeah, that was that was hugely helpful. Thank you. Just, so yeah. this this is a centralized, excuse my, my ignorance, but that is a centralized database uh, hosted well, this by company is, this company is not the centralized database owner. They are just doing lookups into the centralized database. No, there you know, I understand of, that. There are lots of companies. Oh, okay, sorry. But there is like a single database, though, ho or hosted by a single entity that, that right. does this? Right. So, okay. Right. It's a government, that's it's that a government star? identity that's the first. Right. Uh, so, uh, and it, that's changing in the coming year. That's what uh, Isaac was talking about. They're going to transition to a new company, and who the hell knows if that's going to be a good thing or a bad thing. So this will be interesting. Uh, we're hoping that the the old company had no incentive to automate this process because um, mm -hmm. that would require all the carriers to cooperate with each other. But since everybody has to move to a new system, we're kind of hopeful that the new company might put in some APIs and some automation around this because um, that's why porting stinks so bad is there's no incentive for any company to speed up the process of losing a customer. Nobody's willing to spend any money on it. So because the government has now granted the contract to a different company, everyone has to change how they do it anyway in the next couple of years. So hopefully that results in some progress around this system. But today, yes, it's one database. This is a central look at what you're doing. Um, and you can see some of the stuff I just talked about in here, like operator carrier, uh, you know, the operating carrier numbers in here. Um, the city and state in the LADA, where the line is located, what kind of phone line it is, landline or wireless. <coughs> okay, just one more question real quick. So if I found a non-cash... Be super clear. Okay, go ahead. So just one more follow-up. So to be clear, if I found like a non-cash edition of this and we were having a problem with the port, like I could figure out who to point the finger at at least? That is what we do. That's correct. When you call and submit a support okay. ticket to us, we're actually going through this right now. We have a number that bandwidth ported, except bandwidth didn't tell us, but they don't actually have coverage in that area, so they're using level three, and level three is telling bandwidth, is telling us that it's been done correctly. And when we look it up in this tool, it actually shows that it's still assigned to Charter, which is neither of those companies, so we know they haven't done it correctly. So that tells us to go okay. yell at them. Uh, repeatedly until we see a change. Okay, cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Thanks for the question, Rick, and thank you, Darren, for the uh, uh, help with that. Uh, the question here we have is from viewer 81. How are our, how are LOA sent to you? Uh, fax. Uh, most of our port requests come in through um, the, our uh, porting app and they generate an automatic email into us and uh, through there uh, it's required that you attach the a copy of the bill and a copy of an LOA um, so that's how we get them if you were to submit a manual ticket over to us just by emailing us to uh, our support email uh, then you would attach a copy of uh, that uh, uh, LOA uh, we prefer it to be in a PDF uh, format Okay, viewer number 62 uh, is asking, is there an easy way for us, the company who buys DID from one carrier and sells phone service, to check if a number is dropping translations from a different carrier? Um, there is no easy way. To, yeah, yeah, there is, there's oh, no easy way. Oh, to check on dropping translations. Good point. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Isaac. You were on the yeah. path. I'm sorry. Yeah. There is no easy way to uh, check into that. Uh, you know, going back to the presentation, the, the unfortunate part is that the best way to find out is if uh, a phone number is not able to make calls to that 
uh, one number that just ported out. Uh, and if they recited in the same equipment, then that kind of tells us, that's the telltale sign that they are having the issue uh, or that they are, the, the carrier has not dropped uh, translations. Unfortunately, it's not uh, a very, very easy uh, lookup for that. <laughs> Um, all right, question from viewer 114, second Bluetooth question. I think, uh, let's just I think is if we at 2600 can prevent a number from being ported out due to lack of payment, the answer is no, we are not legally allowed to do that. Okay, thank you for the uh, clarification on that. Uh, I was thinking more of a, uh, uh, from other carriers uh, uh, porting in uh, into us. Okay, uh, Peter, uh, asks, once support is complete, does the number go into a spares numbers list within the 10600 account? And then the administrator needs to assign it to uh, user main conference fax or a group. Uh, Peter, the answer is correct. Once a once the uh, number is ported uh, in <coughs> or once it's added into the system, it'll be in a uh, spares numbers and you can assign it um, to any call flow or uh, however you uh, have designated that uh, uh, number to be used. Uh, the same uh, same questions. How do end users usually send these to you? Um, the LOAs are again sent through uh, a uh, either through email uh, as an attachment or a through our uh, porting uh, app. Uh, it'll ask you to upload the uh, file and it'll generate a uh, ticket over to us. So what parts of the whole process are able to be automated and what doesn't? Um, that's a question from uh, another user. Uh, so the, I, I, in this part, the uh, parts that can be automated, I would say, and would be the uh, submittal over to us uh, of the work that uh, of the port request into us that you're wishing to port in. That is, you know, like I said, done through the our uh, porting uh, our porting app, um, where you, you you still have to submit the information, uh, the build and the LOAs uh, over to us, but you know. Um, uh, like Darren was saying earlier, there are not many uh, or any APIs uh, that we can interact with uh, or any carrier can interact with at the uh, MPEX system. So it's uh, a, a lot of it uh, is, is manual. So, uh, Bluetail, how can we legally reject a port out if you don't want the number to be released? Uh, Bluetail, I'll have to uh, get back with you on that one. Uh, I don't believe. Yeah, let me. Uh, I, I can go ahead. I can take that one. Okay. Uh, I've actually answered it in the chat because I figured you would not know the answer to that because I never have run into this. So, this is a, a question we get asked a lot. Um, the specific thing that Bluetail asked here that is important is um, if you're trying to block someone from porting out a number related to um, uh, non-payment. So a lot of people try to block a port out because the customer is behind on their bill. That's actually illegal. You cannot hold a number hostage because the customer has not paid you. Uh, that's a violation of SEC rules and you get sued for that. Um, because of that, uh, the, and there's also another rule that says that you can't, you must respond <coughs> to a port out request within, I think it's 72 hours or something. If all the information is correct, you must agree to respond with a scheduled date and release the number uh, within 72 hours. Now, a lot of you are going to hear that number and be like, but my ports take weeks. Uh, there's a little bit of fuzziness on how long the other side has to verify your credentials but they can't hold the number hostage. Um, most importantly, uh, to be clear, there is, um, there is, how do I explain this? 
a lot of these carriers who do VoIP, they don't even have the facilities to be able to request an approval, so they lamely uh, just auto-approve port-out requests, which is going to freak a lot of you out, um, but is actually considered industry standard by one of the largest providers of services that's out there, bandwidth.com. Bandwidth will uh, auto-accept a port-out, and I think recently they may have finally introduced an API that lets you deny a port within 24 hours, but I don't know that that's real. Um, it's certainly not in implemented yet. But technically speaking, anyone can find any bandwidth.com number, which means companies like Ring Central, sometimes Lana and Jesus, um, uh, some of these other companies out there, you can look up the numbers, Google Voice. And you can actually port those numbers out without the information matching the customer, um, which is a little scary. Uh, so if you're trying to block them because of non-payment, that's illegal. If you're trying ready, to just make sure someone doesn't steal the number, then you can switch to a provider other than a bandwidth or somebody um, who would allow that. Uh, you set a pin on the number, and that's usually the acceptable way to restrict the number from being ported out, is to put a pin on the number. I just think they put it on charts. I just think it all just happens. Did you see some of the emails? I'm not sure who's talking here in the background. Yeah. Oh, I sent one over to you, I thought, like, Basically, Please yeah. make sure you're yeah, muted, whoever's you're talking about sending something over to someone else. Right. And we're plugging along and that everything's going to be good for Monday. Uh, we have somebody on. Uh, there we go. All right, so, um, so anyway, the, uh, uh, the reality is you can, you can put a PIN number on a phone number for certain carriers, which will right. effectively require the PIN number to be known or the port would be rejected. Um, but we have to, you have to tell us you have the intent to do that when you move a number to us so that we put you on a carrier who can actually do that. And no it's carrier will actually library. guarantee this. It's just best effort. So hopefully that helps, Isaac. Yep. Okay. Um, I think uh, let's, I'm going down the line here. Uh, the next question is, are digital uh, signatures acceptable for LOAs from end users, or do they need to print the LOA? Send. Uh, Darren, I believe... Carrier, but these days yeah. it's considered acceptable. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to go down the list here. Regarding numbers we sell, do we have the right to rent versus sell the numbers? Do we? That's an interesting question. Uh, do we have the num? Uh, regarding numbers that we sell, do we have uh, a right to rent versus sell the numbers? Uh, I'm not sure how to answer that one, Darren. I've never, I've never uh, been asked I've, a yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I believe technically if you are selling phone service to somebody, they are technically the owners or the, the end user of the number. They have the right to do what they want with it. There is one exception with that, which is toll-free numbers. Toll-free numbers are not regulated, nor do they follow this pro same process. They actually use a single database that used to be owned by AT&T. It's now part of a company called SMS 800, uh, and ironically, don't ask why it's SMS because it has nothing to do with SMS. But it is, uh, it is a toll-free database company who manages them, and toll-free numbers are considered rented. Nobody, nobody owns toll-free numbers. They can actually be taken back by any t at any time for abuse or otherwise by the uh, uh, 800 SMS uh, folks. Um, but toll-free numbers are the only ones I believe you can rent. Uh, I believe end-user numbers are their technical properties are paying a bill for it, and they can do what they want with them. Uh, okay, and we have a question from Omar. Is it advisable to get new numbers using the GUI, or are there regions where 2600 hertz can provide numbers if we contact you, i.e. .e. if we cannot find those numbers from the GUI? So, Omar, we would uh, advise that you use the GUI um, for uh, your ordering numbers. If for some reason you are not finding numbers in a certain area, definitely let us know and shoot us a uh, an email to support, and we will uh, look um, to see if we can find uh, the, a number for that particular area uh, through different avenues. OK. 
Okay, let me see here. Uh, the going only shoes numbers from carriers who have an API, right? Okay. Okay. So thanks, Darren. All right. So one uh, topic num uh, mentioned was caller ID. Were you going to cover something different there? Uh, so on caller ID, um, we I had initially covered uh, was planning on covering it, but then decided against it. Uh, mm. Only because it's, um, you know, it, it, it's it's pretty uh, simple and, and, and basic, um, and I can go uh, through it here um, real quick. So, <clears throat> uh, I think I was uh, somebody asked earlier uh, about CNM, and the truth of the matter is, each carrier subscribes to different uh, databases, uh, calling name databases. Um, and it, it's up to them to update those, uh, their databases with, uh, new information. Um, we, uh, we, you know, we send the request out to, or, you know, if we get a request to update CNAM on a, or CNAME on a certain number, we will go ahead and do that. Um, but then it is up to the other carriers to update their own databases it's not it doesn't go out automatically to everybody it's up to their the other carrier uh, other carriers to update their own uh, databases and unfortunately there is no uh, time frame there's no uh, uh, guideline if you will of when they have to do it I'm uh, not sure if you covered the landline SMS question. Let me uh, go back up and look your landline uh, SMS. Isaac, I'm probably going to have to take that one too. That's the spider's web. Okay. All right. So Darren Shane has asked earlier. Um, this is a, a very loaded, this is a whole presentation in itself, so I'm only going to be able to give a quick summary here. Uh, the question as asked was, I found that certain carriers restrict the ability to add SMS to a landline number. Is there a way to work with these carriers to remove this restriction? I think what you're actually saying, Darren, is you may get numbers from, let's say, us or bandwidth or uh, peerless or whoever, and you're buying those numbers and using them for voice calls, and then I think you are going to another third-party company who says they can overlay SMS services on top of existing numbers. That is my guess. Yeah, okay, so you're using ZipWeb. Um, that is a loophole in the SMS system. Uh, the way SMS is supposed to work is that care is that phone numbers which are SMS enabled are uploaded into a service called NetNumber. NetNumber is kind of like so this presentation, we've been talking about how there's one organization who keeps track of who, which carriers own which phone numbers, and it is a government-sanctioned entity. Um, that is for voice calls and phone number ownership. There is actually another company. Uh, there are two, actually. One of them is SAP, and one of them is Cineverse. Those companies actually send and receive all SMSs between major carriers in the country and someone in the world. So when you send an SMS from a Verizon phone to an AT&T phone, Verizon has no idea. Verizon only knows that the phone number you're trying to send an SMS to is not theirs. They don't know who it, who it belongs to. So they send the message and the request to deliver it to either Cineverse or SAP. And it used to be that uh, Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, uh, T-Mobile, they all agreed to keep this database up to date that Cineverse and SAP have um, so that that would work and so that your SMSs would reliably go from point A to point B. Uh, then came along VoIP carriers and companies like ZipWhip who made a proposal to SAP and Cineverse. They said, hey, you're only tracking the phone numbers that are on cell phones. And for people who try to text to a number not in your database, you're just not accepting the text. You just reject it. 
And so the first thing they did is they came up with a service that was called Text to Landline. And basically it was a hack that Cineverse and SAP, they don't get paid if they don't deliver the text message. So they said, hey, we can turn this into a surcharge and we'll use a text-to-speech engine and we'll take the SMS and we'll call someone's landline and play them a voice file, you know, a voice prompt, and read them the text message. So if you've ever used text-to-landline, that was basically a hack where technically, it would be like in your web browser, if you typed in an invalid web address, today you get a 404 or you get a, a page that says, you know, that the web server you typed can't be found. Imagine if someone hijacked that and said, well, we couldn't find the website you typed, but uh, here's another service we think you'd like instead, right? So they kind of hijack the, the no route to destination kind of thing. This is the same thing in SMS. It started with a hijack of messages that were non-routable. And it's evolved, and what ZipWhip is now doing is they've actually turned it into a service where if a, an SMS number is not in the net number database, uh, who is the provider who actually tracks all this stuff for Cineverse and SAT, uh, they hijack it, and they put their own name in there as the owner of the phone number, uh, and they redirect the SMSs to them. Well, the problem with that is <laughs> bandwidth and whoever else don't, don't know that they've done that. So bandwidth sends a nightly feed to NetNumber saying, here are all the numbers I still own. After all of today's ports were processed and all the other changes in the system, here are all the numbers that we own. And NetNumber overwrites in their database that Bandwidth is now the owner. So when ZipWhip put their name in there, it might have worked for a day or two. And then when Bandwidth went and updated the database of numbers they own, ZipWhip lost the number again. Uh, so it's kind of this tug of war happening now between the carriers on who really owns the number. These service providers that you're finding who can quote unquote SMS enable a phone number, it is a hack. And there's a very good chance that it will work for a few days and then it will stop working. So we've gotten a lot of complaints to 2600 Hertz where people are like, why don't you enable SMS? There's all these other people doing it and they're unaware of how they're doing it and the way they're doing it is a total hack. And it's resulting in all these problems um, because they're screwing up the master database with a bunch of bogus records. And even the industry itself is now not sure what to do with it, so they started imposing fees for SMS-enabled numbers uh, to try and prevent companies, even like Bandwidth, from just blindly uploading a huge list of numbers and saying, all of these are ours. Uh, the problem is technically not resolved right now, and there isn't a good resolution. The only good way to resolve this is to get your SMS service from the same carrier that you're getting your phone number from. That's the only way to guarantee that the owner of the number in both databases is always going to match. All of these companies who are overlaying services on top of a landline number, they're doing it in this hackish way, and they're selling it as a service without explaining this to you, and they're lying to you and telling you it's reliable, and when it breaks, they blame someone else. And that's not really true. Their service is kind of flawed to start with, and they're kind of playing a game. Um, so that's why I don't, I don't have a good answer to how to prevent this other than to use the same provider for both your SMS service and your uh, voice service. And one of the reasons that has taken us at 2600 Hertz so long to launch an SMS service, because we've had an SMS gateway that software for for over two years, is uh, there's only two main companies out there who actually allow us to list them as the provider but get a straight feed of SMS um, to us. Uh, so that we can own the number, but we can also do what we want with the SMS in an automated way via APIs and a high-speed feed via SMTP, which is the protocol. So we are still working on that, and until that's done, um, there aren't a lot of options. You can go get your own contract with bandwidth and then hook up bandwidth numbers to our system if you wanted, but it's expensive and painful and time-consuming to do that, and then get the SMS through them. I don't necessarily recommend that. Their pricing isn't great, their APIs aren't great, but it will work. Right. But basically the requirement today is the phone number and the carrier uh, for voice and SMS need to be the same. Otherwise you're gonna run into all sorts of issues. Who's the other so carrier? You said bandwidth and who else? No, bandwidth is one of the ones who screws it up. Um, the ones that will allow us to um, overlay I can't remember 
one of them. I think the other one is the old PacWest, who I think is now TNCI. And the problem we have with them is they are they consolidated with a company named Impact Telecom and are now getting out of that business. So the whole thing is a little in flux right now um, until some of the mergers that are happening behind the scenes. Uh, we, we try to not simplify this for you guys so you're not distressed about it. I promise we're not actually trying not to release these features and tools for you. But there have been four mergers of our telecom providers over the past uh, 18 months, which has made this entire thing even more complicated. Um, so PacWest was bought by TNCI. TNCI then merged into Impact Telecom. Impact Telecom is now GTRC or something. Um, and so they haven't consolidated all of their own systems yet, so they can't provide this service to anyone new yet. Um, so, yeah, that's basically the issue. All right. Thank you, Darren, for your uh, explanation of that. Um, I don't see any more questions on the uh, chat uh, channel. Um, it looks like we are a little, went a little bit over. Um, but before we go, I'd like uh, to say one thing. Um, we are looking uh, to start hosting the webinars uh, more often. And, uh, you know, we want to provide you uh, content uh, that you guys uh, are going to be wanting to listen to you know what what things uh are you excited to learn about um if you do have uh suggestions or ideas of what you would like to see covered uh please email uh marketing at 2600 hertz.com and that is m-a-r-k-e-t-i-n-g at 2600hz.com and i'll go ahead and put that on the um uh, uh chat channel as well uh that way you guys uh, have it on there thanks Isaac. no problem guys uh you all have a great one and uh we look uh forward to hearing from you and we'll see you on the next one sounds good thanks